All right. This week, our guest is Robin Hansen, who's the Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University and also an author at OvercomingBias.com. Robin, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> so for our listeners, um, why don't you just describe a little bit about you know, what you do for work, what are, the, what are your main areas that you talk about, that you teach, and that you study? Uh, I'm all across the map, so unfortunately that means uh, it's a longer answer than for most people. I do some things on uh, the social implications of future technology. I do some things on uh, trying to understand and collect strange things people do and make sense of them. And I also work on something called prediction markets, our methods of information aggregation. So I both, I found that uh, there's a lot of problems in the world and, and a lot of ideas for solving them. And I've tried to contribute some ideas like prediction markets, but often uh, these ideas we generate run into the problem that uh, we often take people at their word at what they say they're trying to do. And we produce a solution that uh, gives them what they said they wanted and turns out they lie <laughs> about what they want. And uh, that's a, a problem for us generating solutions for them. And that's, that's in part. So, so I, I think that may also be the case because you know people often don't necessarily know what they want. There's some like right. you know, psychology behind this, right? Is it? Do you get into that in your study? Ah, uh, sure. Yes, absolutely. Try to understand why people aren't aware of what they want and why would there would be such a dis big disconnect between what they think they want and what they actually want. And I think that's uh, really something that, that you, you hammered home the first time I heard you speak. And that was the first time I met you at the O'Reilly Media or O'Reilly Blockchain Summit in San Francisco. And it was, it was an interesting point is, and this, I think the, the example you gave is in management about how they don't always want to know what, you know, what, the, what exactly is the, the most likely thing they're going to do or the best thing to do. They want to do what they want to do and that's just human psychology. And it really, you know, illustrates, I think, a lot of different aspects of prediction markets and just the way that they can be perceived and the accuracy that they can have if, if they're really, you know, large enough and there's a large enough pool of people. So are, are we getting our head of ourselves? Should we give oh, the absolutely. viewers uh, a quick yeah. intro to the concept? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to let Eric go next because I've had a chance to speak with you multiple times. So I've sat on the learning tree and I'm going to let them break down <laughs> here. So. Sure. So, 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 Robin, what got you into this field of research? What sort of got brought about, you know, your interest in decentralized or prediction markets in general, and then ultimately decentralized prediction markets? Uh, you know, I like many other people, just interested in solving various problems of the world, and many problems in the world. Uh, you know, we think of institutions to solve it, different arrangements that might change people's incentives and what they tell each other. Uh, and many of the institutions we have are basically put some guy in charge and, and tell him to solve the problem somehow. And that's, in a sense, the generic centralized solution. Somebody in charge and then make them responsible for solving it. Uh, and so, in some sense, people think of anything else as decentralized relative to the put a guy in charge solution. So, in that sense, anybody who's interested in designing institutions is implicitly interested in decentralized solutions because they're trying to do something else than put one guy in charge and tell him to solve it. <laughs> So I hear a lot about Hayekian influence and sort of your, um, your background, your explanation of institutions' roles in a coordinated human action here. How has sort of your background economics influence um, your thinking on prediction markets and your interest in them? Well, actually, the order came the other way, in a sense. So I was hanging around a place called Xanadu, which was an early group of people who foresaw the web and imagined what the web would be. And uh, they imagined that uh, backlinks would be the key to making good conversation on the web and, and making good, solid uh, beliefs. And I came to doubt how well backlinks might work. And since they were rabid libertarians, uh, the idea of just having betting markets on these things came naturally to mind. And I, you know, tried to explore that. And then I sort of felt like I r ran into roadblocks not having enough context and credentials. And so I decided to go back to school to get a PhD. And then I learned economics and social science, much greater depth. So in a sense, uh, prediction markets brought me to economics more than the other way around. It's interesting that you, you brought up Xanadu, and uh, what, exactly, what exactly did you think of the World Wide Web when it first came to be, and the, 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 you know, the opposing viewpoints that I hear existed at the time on the two? Oh, well, I mean, the uh, people that I was hanging around Xanadu, they had a very detailed and ambitious goal in mind and a very integrated design and they kept sort of adding features to it and raising the bar for what it had to be 
uh, which is why, in part, they didn't deliver very quickly. And so when the World Wide Web first showed up, to them, it looked way too cut rate and simple because it didn't have all the features they wanted and all the you know, uh, guarantees it was going to give and things like that. But I think most of them have come to acknowledge that that's the right thing to do first, to do something fast and simple and robust and get it out there. And they had made a mistake in trying to add too many features and then to make it too high a definition of what they were trying to do. Yeah, so I, I actually, I was aware of the Zenodu project uh, and I followed it for a number of years. And what fascinated me is that it, it actually predated uh, the World Wide Web and the idea of um, you know, unidirectional links. And I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I think just last year, I think they finally shipped after 40 years maybe of um, a, a prototype actually, an example of this. Uh, and that's, it strikes me that, you know, from an entrepreneurial background, that the, uh, the, the, you need to start small and progress iteratively. Uh, do you think that, what other lessons do you think could be learned from sort of the model of Xanadu as like a, a world changing technology? Looking at it in retrospect, it looks like, you know, it could have been superior, uh, but it just didn't get to market fast enough. What other lessons are there to be gained from the case of Xanadu? Well, I mean, I think there's a bunch of just standard lessons that old fogies who've been around sort of know that, that basically young people have to learn again. And it's one of these mysteries of human nature. Why do we keep having to relearn things? things? Why can't we just tell each other across the generations? But certainly this is one of the standard ones, which is, um, you know, if you're going to have an idea, have a product, have something to make a big difference, it needs to be pretty simple. And it needs to be simpler than most young people tend to imagine. It needs to be pretty straightforward because there's just going to be so many complications you're going to have to deal with. People tend to abstract away from the complications. They tend to say, well, let's just focus on this basic problem and then worry about the other things later. But those other things are most of the real problem. So you got to get to them as fast as you can and, and plow through them. So there's no escaping dealing with the, all the actual problems, no matter how mundane or, or le less gra you know, grand than you were hoping. I mean, you know, some of the problems a real business has to deal with are grand and the sort of thing you want to talk about in a big talk and the vision of, of concepts and high-level goals. And others are just like, you know, very mundane little things, you know, like these two people don't get along or how do I tell this funder that, you know, their, their paperwork or their taxes go or, you know, there's just a lot of little things that have to, and, and basically most businesses fail on some stupid little thing <laughs> not being done right. Yeah, absolutely. Attention to detail is extremely important, in my opinion. Um, that sort of gets me to the next question. I, I know that you were involved in the cypherpunk, you know, mailing list. Um, did you, did you did that follow the Xanadu uh, involvement that you had? Uh, what what got you excited about that, and what was your interest? Well, I mean, that's again this idea that there's some like abstract software capabilities that could then be realized and produce interesting real social outcomes. And, uh, you know, the people who implemented, say, uh, you know, the cypherpunk-based products, that uh, they did, like, take the advice to Siri, and they didn't try to add too many features, and they did try to keep it simple and robust. And, you know, they, they tended to be more solid about <laughs> knowing how to do those things. Um, but, you know, that's a great example of being sure that the people who say they want something really want it, unfortunately. So, I mean, back at the time of cypherpunks, you know, almost any time people talked about the future of computing and the media or a book or something like that, the issue of privacy came up. And it was always a really big deal. Everybody talked as if privacy was this really big, important thing. And of course, le you know, legislation was, was trying to discuss it and deal with it. And cypherpunks was basically saying, hey, we can produce more privacy and we could just like make PGP email and it'll add privacy and surely people want privacy as much as they talk about, all we have to do is offer it to them uh, at, at you know, relatively low cost, and surely that will be the end of the game, right? Mm -hmm. And it turned out people just did not actually want privacy nearly as much as they talked about it in grand talking head shows or whatever. And so it, even the small cost that it took to adopt something like PGP was, in fact, higher cost than most people were willing to pay. And even though the software was created and it was robust and it was solid and distributed widely, it in fact was hardly ever used. So do you think that, the, that part of that is the, the accessibility of that? Like, it, it, I'm sure in you know, 1992, 93, in the very early days when PGP became a thing, um, that it, it, it probably was com comparatively easy to use then. 
Uh, then we go and look at today, and even in the business world today, we're trying to get people to you know, secure their communications. Uh, and email is so widely prevalent today that, uh, and, and PGP is like really one of the only answers that we have to secure that system. Do you think that part of it is uh, related to the user experience or making it easier to use or perhaps even enabled by default? Or do you genuinely think that it, it was just people didn't want it? Oh, no, I, th I think, you know, all else equal, they might take it. It's not that they disliked it, but it's just their positive value for it was so small that even these small deals in trouble were enough for them. I mean, you know, and it's an important thing about scale economies. You know, we, we want to use tools that everybody else uses, and there's big advantages in all sharing the same tool. So people building a tool have to decide, you know, do most people using this tool want this feature enough for me to bother to implement it and, and pay the cost of supporting it? And they, most of them decided, no, most people did not want to bother with this, uh, uh, you know, privacy enabling features because, no, that was going to be too much trouble and they didn't, weren't actually willing to, to bother with, with the trouble of it. So, which is disappointing, of course. From, from the grand point of view of everybody talking about how important privacy was, it's, it seems kind of crazy that, that people would be that close to it and not actually take it. But yeah. That's, yeah. that's the real thing, that people really actually didn't care very much. And now that, you know, it's, what, 20 years later, and they're, we're talking about something like the cypherpunks involvement in this. Well, did you, two questions here. Did you at the time think that it would become this influential? And now, what do you think of it now and that you're hearing, you know, completely different people who are not born yet discussing these issues and referring to posts from 1992? Right. Well, of course, I mean, it, it is heartening that these issues don't go away entirely. And one of the hopes many people have is that, you know, it just takes a long time to make these changes. And if you stick with it long enough, eventually you could win. And just because you don't win in 20 years doesn't mean you don't win eventually. So that's the kind of hopeful scenario. Um, but the other thing is just ask, okay, it's different. And are those differences enough? Uh, so some people say, okay, people don't care very much about privacy. You're right. But they do care about money. And, uh, you know, if, if you can give them more money enough through using, uh, you know, the cryptocurrencies, then maybe they will bother with this where they didn't bother with email privacy because maybe they really do care more about this. I mean, so that's the bottom line question. A lot of people talk about caring about, say, the privacy of their money. And the question is, how much do they actually care about the privacy of their money? It's very interesting. I mean, we, we encounter those trade-offs a lot and kind of explore decentralized technology. So there's kind of a user benefit trade-off. There's obviously like you said, the scaling uh, trade-off. And I imagine sort of having an understanding of economics and those kind of value decisions is very helpful for understanding why people act the way they do. Uh, as you go a part of the cyberpunk movement, um, what sort of advice or understanding economics can offer to movements in general? Do you think it, do you think having a movement is actually an effective way of introducing change, or do you think we really need to kind of think about uh, other ways of kind of changing behavior or incentivizing? Well, honestly, you, you talk about like what can economics bring, but I think economists are actually pretty naive too about <laughs> taking people at the word for uh, what they want. The economists, like, you know, if you, economists who study medicine mostly assume that people want out of medicine what they say they want, which is to be healthy. And in fact, that, that doesn't seem to work so well as an explanatory framework for understanding medicine. And similarly for education, most economists who deal with education assume they're going to school, learn things, et cetera. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily give economists that much credit for you know, digging behind the scenes and seeing what's really going on. Um, you, know, you, you basically have to figure out uh, what do people want and uh, can you get it for them here? That's maybe, maybe uh, rephrase the question, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, I guess the question is sort of is understanding sort of how um, human behaviors change, and I think that's a great answer to it, is really just kind of find actually what people actually want, not their stated preferences, yes. but real ones. Well, you asked about a movement. Yeah. I mean, one of the key things a movement do is like get past some initial point of awkwardness and a scale, insufficient scale, to get you to the point where there's insufficient scale and uh, awkwardness. But I think the key point is, you will have to transition. So you can't think of the movement solution as the permanent solution. I mean, movement is a temporary thing that creates enthusiasm, creates energy, creates a willingness to suffer even in the short term to be part of something. But then eventually people go on to other things, the fashions change, the interests change, 
And at that point, you have to ask what's left, right? And so you'll need to have a big enough community of users using something that's easy enough and something that they value enough even when it's not a fashion and even when it's not like getting them kudos at parties or whatever, uh, that they'll stick, keep using it. And that's the hard part. I mean, a lot of things people will, people will suffer with an awful lot so they can brag about it at parties. So yeah. the hard part is to get them to suffer with it later when it's not in fashion. Yeah, I, I mean, speaking from the perspective of someone who uh, puts himself through, a, you know, absurd hurdles, quite frankly, just so that I can like make sure that what I have is secure. It's I would say that it, none of this stuff is ready for public consumption yet. Like even when we start talking about Bitcoin, which is now uh, sort of achieved widespread widespread attention at the very least, it's just not ready. And as you talk, it sort of reminds me of the the Gartner hype cycle, right? So. Where do you think we are? I mean, maybe there's like three or four different fields here between like, you know, cryptography and privacy and currency and privacy and some of these things. But where do you think on each of these things that we are with the Gartner hype cycle? Well, I can speak best to prediction markets because I've been tracking that very closely and I think I understand that very well. I'm really more on the periphery of cryptocurrency. And so I, I, I can't really speak very expertly about current trends or exactly who's doing what or what's likely to happen soon. I can talk about the fundamentals of like what determines whether it wins or loses in the end and like the basic issue of whether people want the product or not and which kind of products that could be here. I can speak to those more, but in terms of like where we are in a cycle, like I can't speak to about our prediction markets. I can at least talk a bit more about the fundamentals. Um, sure, please go right ahead. So, um, so a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the emotional appeal of prediction markets to many people and the emotional appeal of cryptocurrency. There's this idea that there's the authorities out there, there's the man and he's stopping us from our freedom and, and we're getting in our way and we just want to do our own thing, man. And you know, there's the feeling that uh, we, we want the ability to do things without permission Abby, and we've been having to ask for permission. and. We, we should just have the right to the ability to do things without permission. And that sort of feeling of wanting to do things that are forbidden uh, or wanting to have the freedom to choose for yourself is a strong emotional appeal in the abstract and even as sort of a part of a movement identity and being with other people. And I think both of the, the, those both are part of the appeal of cryptocurrency and prediction markets. But I think that doesn't last really as a basic product to get people to actually do stuff when it's not in fashion, where there's not a movement. So in prediction markets, uh, I think you know there are people who just want to bet as, as speculation and fun and entertainment. People have always been doing that, of course, betting on sports, et cetera. Um, and there are legal limits on that, and so that reduces the quantity of amount people do. And if you could evade some of those legal limits, then there would be some more of that, but not vastly more. And I'm not sure it would actually make the world much of a better place if more people bet on sports. But uh, the, the other interesting product is like organizations who want to know things like a company who wants to know if they'll make a project deadline. And there's the new thing of, of using prediction markets to find those things out and giving organizations a mechanism to add that. And that's the sort of thing that if organizations could use prediction markets to find out if they'll make deadlines, that can last past some fashion cycle or some trying to stick it to the man sort of energy. Um, but it depends on people and organizations actually wanting to know that. Um, so like, well, in sports betting, for I mean, in betting, for example, there's a lot of sports betting and then there's a lot of intellectual type people who think sports betting is boring, but wouldn't it be fun to bet on something more interesting like particle physics or you know some latest result in psychology? And yes, that would be, and that fits their self-identity as the sort of thing they might like to do. But the fact is they most of them won't actually want to bother to do that. Because uh, you know, even if it were legal, they just like distract. They have other things they want to do. They're not really that far into that. I mean, people who are into sports are like really into sports, and sports betting people are like crazy into it. And you know, it takes a lot of people who are that crazy into something to make a big demand for it. Um, so, in prediction markets, the fundamental question is: Are enough organizations actually interested in finding out answers to key questions like what will sales be? When will we complete our deadline? What would happen if we change this? It seems in the abstract like there's huge value to be produced there that as organizations seem to make those estimates really badly an awful lot and all the data we have about previous experience suggests the prediction markets can substantially uh, increase the accuracy of those sorts of estimates at a pretty low cost. Nevertheless, 
a lot of organizations act as if they don't really want that information. It's not really given the political costs of making people look bad. And so that's an open question for prediction markets in general and for prediction markets they connected with uh, blockchains yeah. and things like that is how much will individual and organizations really want to bother to produce that information and, and to get it. Where, where do you think that that resistance comes from? I mean, I, I, I see this in, in a lot of capacities. Do you think it's a natural resistance to change or is it something else? Something else, actually. That is, organizations that have had prediction markets in them, that they've tried them out, people have gotten used to them, they've gotten successful st numbers, P they've, surveys have said people like it, they enjoy it, it's giving them satisfaction, they're getting useful information, even then they don't continue it when like a particular manager is made to look bad by a prediction market that says that they were wrong or at fault about something. So some of the most successful prediction markets in firms have been markets that predict project deadlines. Like, will we make this deadline? And there's a lot of dramatic examples of the manager and the official people said, yes, of course, we're going to make the deadline. It's on schedule. And then you open a prediction market and the people at the bottom all over the place, they get to participate and they say, no way, no chance, you know, a few percent of percent chance at most guys they're not going to make that deadline and of course that makes the guy running the project look bad it's it's useful information obviously it's actionable information but it still makes people look bad and the standard story on project failure is most people who have a project and if they expect to failure, what the story they want to tell afterward they want to set themselves up for the story which is the thing that made us fail no one could have seen that coming it was just out of the blue who could have seen that so yeah. it's not my fault, it's nobody's fault, because nobody could have seen that coming. Uh -huh. and that's a standard story. Not only do they want to tell that story, their boss wants to tell that story, because their boss looks bad if they look bad. And so everybody wants to pass up the story. Hey, no one could have seen that coming. But of course, a prediction market, if it kept saying this is not going to happen, it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen, it doesn't really fit the story that, boom, something came out of the blue that no one could have seen coming, because it was saying, hey, we saw it coming. Right. It, it's an admission that the machine is better than us, then that the math is better than us, right? And that's something we're afraid of. And maybe, maybe I don't even think it's about the machine. I mean, people understand that these things are just other people at the end of it. It's just like, you know, a telephone line. It's not you blame the wire or something. You blame <laughs> the guy on the other end of the phone and, and what they were saying. Right. And that's, a, that's a great point. Um, you, Sort of broadening the discussion a bit, uh, we talk a lot about the, the idea of uh, futurarchy from a political perspective. Can you yeah. expand a little on that and what that means? Sure. So a simple prediction market, because we've been talking about it for a while, is just uh, there's a claim like, will we make the deadline? And then there's a uh, people get to bet on it, basically, and they buy and sell bets. And people have an incentive to set the market odds to be whatever they think is the correct odds for estimating what's likely to happen, because if they think the market odd is wrong, then they make money by correcting it. Uh, we can extend the simple idea of predicting things to what's called a decision market where we bet on the consequence of a decision. So we might say, okay, it looks like we're not going to make the deadline if we do nothing. What if we add more personnel? What if we redefine the feature set? What if we move the deadline later? Right? We can ask if we did something different, what are the outcomes? So a decision market is, is a set of markets about the consequence of a decision, and if they're really directly set up to tell you about the consequence of a the decision, they can advise you about what to do. They could say, Hey, if you want, you know, if you want to make the deadline, this is what you got to do. So, Futarchy is really just another name for uh, setting up a decision market in an organization around sort of the organization's fundamental goal, so that we try to do whatever it is maximizes our goal. So, in a for-profit corporation, for example, we might take a stock price as a good proxy for what we want. We, well, what do we all want? We all want our company to be worth more. We're going to do whatever it takes to make the company worth more. What do we do? So, a uh, decision markets could say, ah, well, if you hire this guy, it looks like that'll make the company be worth more. If you fire this guy, it'll make the company work for you. If you add this product, if you drop that product, or whatever, they would just say the consequence of each decision for this key metric of what's the company going to be worth. So a few turkey is really just setting up decision markets about key decisions of an organization uh, connected to the key outcome the organization has agreed to care about, such as the stock price. Now, in other organizations, such as a nonprofit, you could pick some other measure of the outcome you care about, like the number of lives you've saved, or uh, some other, or some awards you might get, or you know whatever else it is. But the key idea of Futarchy is set up an organization and make the key decisions based on what a speculative market says about which outcomes will, you know, be produced by which choices. Um, so it, it's not a, something that we haven't been able to get people to try. So 
A lot of organizations have tried prediction markets where they just straight predict sales or uh, project completion dates and things like that. But these conditional markets are a little harder to do. In a sense, they're more sensitive because they're closer to a decision. So they, they more obviously tell you what to do. So they give you less excuse if you choose not to follow the advice. So why are these in, prices? In fact, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, I think if you don't want to make my interjection. Uh, so I'm wondering sort of about futurearchy and the idea of kind of using prices to coordinate um, decisions. Why are prices better than votes in this instance? What's, what's really special about the market aspect of this, in your opinion? Well, you want to separate out value decisions from uh, fact-based estimates. That is where, you know, there's, I'd say vote on values, but bet on beliefs. So uh, the best, maybe voting is a good way to, to aggregate values, to, to weigh us all and decide what we want. But betting is a better way to figure out what we believe, what is true. Uh, voting doesn't tell you what's true. Voting tells you what somebody wants. So you don't necessarily have a good incentive with voting to figure out what the truth is and, and tell it to everybody, but betting you do. Um, so I, I mean, I'm not saying betting should be everything. I mean, there's obviously we do have to figure out values. We have to aggregate values and decide what we want. And that's a key thing we all have to do. And betting doesn't do that as well. Uh, but, but we also, and in fact, mostly have to figure out how to get what we want. And betting is a great way to figure out how to get what we want. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, your position as I would say the godfather of prediction markets, that is the nickname I will use for, for the rest of this podcast now, uh, has given you, you know, a unique, a unique position, especially in the past couple of years because of the emergence of Nate Silver. And, you know, obviously I think that the fact that he was covering baseball really made it something that was easier to consume for the public because a lot of people like sports, as you were saying. Uh, he's brought your ideas to that entirely new audience. And I have to say that a lot of that line of thinking was new to me when I, when I first researched him and learned more. Uh, what do you think about the statements that he made about you? Ha have you? Have you had contact with them? And what, what exactly do you think that he's done positive in saying that a prediction market of enough scale would outperform his, his model? Uh, Nate and I you know, had lunch one day when he was writing his book. So we, we met personally and you know, had a long conversation. Uh, and he's a, he's a smart guy. He's a personal guy. I like him. Um, I'm not sure uh, prediction markets have thrived in the time period since he wrote his book, so I, I don't necessarily see a, a connection there between prediction markets thriving per se. I'm not blaming him for, for that per se, but uh, I, I don't necessarily see a big demand. I, I see more of a demand for what people this call big data or statistical analysis. And in fact, within most organizations, it, it, there is usually a much bigger demand for hiring a specialist to give an analysis than there is for a prediction market. And unfortunately, one of the reasons for that is you know that if the guy gives you the wrong answer in statistical analysis, you can basically tell him to go back and do it again until you get the answer you want. <laughs> That's extremely common for people doing analysis for companies. Um, and so that makes people more comfortable with that process. The prediction market has the problem that it's just hard to fudge. You know, you commit to this process and then it produces this answer and it's visible and it might not be the answer you want. Yeah, and in my comment, I, I, miss, I actually misspoke. I actually should have been clearer and spoke about Beige, the entire Bayesian thought of statistics and that method. I should have been clearer there. I apologize. Because I, you're, you're completely right. right in market, uh, the comment. And other than in trade, it has not been that huge. So I just wanted to clarify what I meant there. So sorry about that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, you okay. <laughs> we have an awesome Google Hangout lag. Yeah. yeah so, um, I, as you talk about Futarchy, um, it strikes me this this concept of you know uh, the machine, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, that there is a, a certain sense of autonomy that can be created. Right? Uh, you could, in theory, create an autonomous system to follow one of these prediction markets and even feed questions into it, uh, and then outsource sort of like its its control mechanism. Uh, do you think that there's an important human element to uh, t taking the inside gain from a prediction market? Or is this something that could be automated and perhaps might enable a future Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's certainly possible to create many kinds of organizations uh, that are not like the usual organizations. And computer elements can be part of them, but just lots of people. So, so there's two distinctions we're focused on here. We should, we should. One is just the, the standard organization as we have it now is a human hierarchy, right? There's people at the top, and they are in control, and they delegate down, and then people do things at the bottom. And in that structure, 
we, we could imagine other structures besides a hierarchy but that organize people, such as a prediction market or voting or, the, or a market. And within another structure like that, you can also imagine swapping out some of the components for machines. So I think the machine versus person sitting in these slots is really less interesting or less important than the overall structure. And we're just a long way away from being able to have machines swap in for people anyway. So, but eventually we will. But I think the how do people feel about organizations that aren't hierarchies? And, and I think people are a little two-faced about this. So at the first level, most people dislike hierarchy at an intuitive level. They think, you know, they're suspicious of big business, they're suspicious of big government, and they, they think we're all should just be better off being in, you know, small is beautiful, being small groups and small and voting and people like abstractly the idea of being in uh, organizations that aren't hierarchies uh, that's what people say but <laughs> when people choose like where to work and what to do uh, they actually choose hierarchies pretty consistently uh, and there's a lot of data suggesting like other sorts of work organizations are substantially less productive and so now um, you know, we have to ask well, what's going on. Why do people so consistently choose and defer to hierarchies and they badmouth it so much? You know, so one answer, of course, and it's partly true, is that hierarchy ha hierarchies have a lot more flexibility than, you get, than people like to give them credit for. You know, the guy at the top can quickly change issues, change focus. Uh, he can get things done. He can coordinate. Uh, you don't have to specify a lot of rules. There's going to be a lot of hidden and unanticipated issues that can be dealt with immediately and straightforwardly in a hierarchy. So hierarchies deserve more credit because there's actually a lot of decisions that do require a few central people to get things done. There's some truth to that, but I don't think that's all the truth. Um, so like one standard story of a hierarchy, uh, managers in a hierarchy is that they are like scientific decision makers, right? So people go to business school and the image you get out of business school and they like to project is, well, decisions need to be made and so I collect information and process it and I put it in my spreadsheet and I calculate the best thing to do and then I send the orders down, but I have lots of meetings and people want to present it as a big sort of calculational machine, right? And that's kind of bullshit <laughs> to, to a certain degree. Um, in, a certain, in a sense, managers are more fundamentally politicians than they are like calculators, right? There are these big complicated coalitions that need to be built and they need, and managers like, in a sense, put more effort into of being inspiring and being um, and motivating people and creating the impression of, of a movement towards something. There's, there's just an awful lot more sort of managing impressions and, uh, you know, making people feel comfortable and people, you know, th than there is like calculating. So uh, it makes sense if you think about organizations that way, that uh, if they've been telling the story of being a great decision maker, but re what they really are is politicians and motivators, then um, if you know their story of what they're doing, being the calculator, that story implies the prediction market should be pretty because that's what they say, that's what they say they want to do. But uh, in, um, it can get in the way of the other things they're really doing. So, so as a concrete example, say you've got a project deadline, uh, and how does effort affect depend on whether you, the chances will make the deadline? And so, a standard observation is. If we're really sure to make the deadline, or we're really sure not to make the deadline, why should I work hard on this project, right? It's when I'm on the edge of thinking we might or might not make the deadline, that's when I'm really motivated to work hard. And managers know that. And so managers quite often want to put their workers on the edge of believing we may or may not make the deadline, let's all work together and do it. And so if the if truth is not right close to that edge, they'll want to lie about the truth to put their workers believing right on the edge so they can uh, work hard and so managers often really do try to manage the impression of whether we'll make the deadline in order to produce more effort and it's less about accuracy in making the deadline and there's a lot of other data that seems to support this so for example managers software engineer managers who are accurate about predicting projects are less liked by their supervisors than ones who are more optimistic <laughs> Uh, that's an unfortunate case, but uh, it's seemingly accurate. You know, as my experience as a software engineer, I've, I've seen this in the flesh uh, in, in real world organizations. So, right. So, I think as an advocate of prediction market, I have to say if you want information, this is a great way to do it, but I'm not going to claim information is the only thing anybody should ever want. And I can, I'm, there are situations where information gets in the way of other things. Basically, um, if you're trying to trick people into something, 
or, or manage their impression in an inaccurate way to motivate them, then yeah, accurate forecasts may get in your way. Right, okay. So let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit, and we're starting to come to the end of our, our duration here. Uh, so I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your role at Consensus Point. Uh, describe to the audience Consensus Point and what your participation in it is. Uh, Consensus Point is a, uh, a firm, a uh, for-profit firm, that provides uh, prediction market software and services. And you know I've been advising them for many years. Uh, there are a number of firms in the area which have been trying to provide software uh, you know, and services in the prediction market area. The industry has certainly evolved a lot over the last decade. Um, and you know, we could talk about that and, and how other companies might fit in there. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm eager to help companies um, try out prediction markets. And uh, I've learned, and many, many, we've all learned many things about what companies really seem to want more in prediction markets and what they don't want. And uh, they're, but they're still give, they're still working at it, and they're having some success. Um, they're focused in the area of at the moment focused in the area of basically substituting for focus groups in uh, customer and uh, evaluations of products. Um, you know, which is a reasonable thing to do, uh, but it is sort of moving away from the core. In, in some sense, the most sensitive topics in companies are the topics where big people in the company are felt responsible for them. So the safest subjects are the ones farthest from that. So people are the most comfortable using prediction markets to forecast customers, competitors, suppliers, or even like new projects that nobody's doing yet. I wonder if, if anybody should do. Because for all of these things, there are, there are fewer people in the company who will look bad for any particular answer. The problem is, 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 is a prediction market if you, if you put up a market and one of the answers will make somebody look bad, well, they won't like that. So you try to like take it far away from anybody around who will have it look bad. So it's, it's you know, if you ask about which, which versions of, of a product customers will like, that doesn't tend to make anybody in the company look bad. So yeah. people are more willing to do that. Yeah. So, so you also uh, have, been, also, as I understand it, become an advisor for Tony's company, Augur. Yes. Uh, can you describe a little bit about how that came to be and your relationship there? Well, I mean, they, they could say more about how. They said, would you like to be an advisor? And I said, sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I give, us, give us some background. Um, I was actually flown into town, and uh, I, I, that was my second day there. And we were at the convention, and uh, Jeremy, a member of our team, uh, invited you out to dinner with us. And uh, I, was, I was thrilled. Uh, Jack and Joey were really excited. I thought Joey was you know, going to freak out. It was, it was, he was very into meeting you. And um, we were all very excited. So we got a chance to chat with you and learn. You know, I remember I think that night you stayed until like 11 p.m. at the Auger House, just talking about you know various aspects of not just prediction markets but yeah. a lot of things. And we asked, and I, I accepted, and here we are. And we've we've had a you know I've personally had a couple meetings with you discussing various issues with it, and not, you know positive, negative, what we can do, what we shouldn't do, a lot of different variables, a lot of different aspects. And you've really given us some good advice on a variety of things, and. Um, you know, it's something where having someone that is influential to this line of thinking as you, as an advisor, is invaluable. I, I can't say enough about how, how much it's helped us and how much we're appreciative of it. And, you know, it, what we're doing is, is different. And, you, you know, and, and as you can tell, and I would like to get you to speak on this for a second if you have it, is, you know, the addition of decentralizing it has the opportunity to solve issues. And... The, the brilliance of the way that Jack and Joey preceded the Oracle problem, I think, is another uh, is another real benefit to what, what we're offering. And it, there, there's so many interesting uh, parts of it other than that. But what, what do you think about Augur and, you know, in general, and what, what you've learned from working with the team and, and just general feelings of it? Well, I think, I mean, the most of it, I mean, Augur is not just a prediction market company. It's a blockchain-based prediction market company. And so the interesting question there is, what is the differential market or the added market for that extra set of features that that enables? So I mean, I know a lot about prediction markets in general and who wants them and then what they can do with them. Uh, I know less, and we all know less, about uh, to what extent are people willing to pay the extra cost for the implementation tools that you're using to get the extra benefits that those tools allow, which are basically uh, to do things without permission, in a sense. That is, you set up these markets and uh, there's nobody in charge. They aren't in any one place. 
And so it's hard for anybody to say stop that because there's nobody to say it to. Uh, and so, you know, and so there presumably is some demand for markets like that. Uh, but the open question is uh, how much and, you know, where are the people who don't have markets today because if they made one, someone would say stop that. Uh, and you could now make a market where nobody can say stop that. Um, you know, which questions will that be on and uh, who will want to do that? You know, and, and I and I honestly don't know. As I say, you know, I just think at the very basic level, you ignore that feature just because most companies actually are free to create prediction markets within themselves. That's actually not a problem. So this really can't mainly be for them because they already have the ability to do what they want if they want to do something. And the main interesting thing is they aren't that interested in doing things. But uh, within markets that cross organizational boundaries that involve people from several organizations or just very broad public markets, those are things where there's more barriers at the moment. So those are more places where uh, this new um, approach could allow more activity. And the basic question is, do people, how many people want that and at what trouble? Of course, and you know, as we talked about before, there's how much value people place on it, and there's also how easy do you make it. And of course, that's the thing in your you can your control. How easy will you make it? So that's something I don't know yet from the software. Uh, that, you know, and of course, it'll be not so easy, and then get easier with time. You guys there? Um, yeah, we're back now. We um, could have predicted oh. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So uh, you were saying I think you were in the middle of a sentence when we actually got disconnected. But which sentence? Come on, give me a hint. <laughs> you were, you were, uh, yeah. Because uh, we kind of, kind of cut out, and then, yeah. So I think you were speaking near, near the end of the speech on Augur and what the market would be, and you were unsure how many people wanted to use it, and uh, it was basically the last things we heard. Okay, so I mean, maybe I was repeating myself, <laughs> right? But the the question is, how many people want, like, to be able to bet on things that are, they don't have permission to bet on, uh, and and. People like the idea that you know they should be allowed to do things that they aren't now allowed to do. They they like they they dislike being told what they can't do, but yeah. once they're allowed to do things, that doesn't mean they actually do them. So that's the open question. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so uh, we are coming to a close now. Though, um, is is there anything that we haven't covered today? Maybe some places where people can find more information about your work. Uh, I'm sure you've got a, a, a page on your at your uh, your what your university. Wow. Like, where can people so find just Google, information? Google my name. I'll, I'll show up at the top. So, no <laughs> all right. That's uh, sense we've gotten. It is. <laughs> all right, guys. So just Google Robin Hanson, and you'll be able to find his work. There you go. On, uh, all of these things. Uh, is there anything else you want to cover uh, before we part ways? Oh, um, there's still, there'd be lots of interesting subjects to continue, but they'd probably all take more than two minutes. So. <laughs> well, we would, we would be more than happy to have you on again at some point in the future to cover of other subjects. So We're happy to do that. Okay, great. So, all right, listeners, that's going to be it for us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Robin Hansen, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Take care, everyone.